Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Glad you could all make it. I'll be reading a little story for you in just a couple of minutes. Um, but first, I, I would like my tea. Is there tea? I was told there would be tea. Is there tea coming somewhere here? Here comes my tea. Thank you. Thank you. This is called The Day the Carnival Came to Town. And I don't know if I should give you a little background or not. Um, the story was sort of inspired by a song that my band wrote. Um, some of you may or may not know that I am in a band. And this, the song, the song came about and then the story kind of formed, which happens sometimes. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. I will go ahead and read. There was once a place. It was no special place of any consequence other than a particular house in it. In that ordinary sort of house lived an ordinary sort of family, the foresters. There was May Forrester, the mother, Ned Forrester, the father, and naturally, little Franny Forrester. Franny was turning nine years old on this particular sort of day. It was a day in late May and the carnival was in town. May and Ned agreed to take little Franny to the carnival for her birthday and perhaps even let her win some sort of toy from some sort of game. A game that Ned would play, a game that Ned would win. Little Franny didn't know this yet because it was only morning and the rooster hadn't yet rang out his cock-a-doodle-doo. That silly little rooster was always crowing first thing in the morning. The foresters didn't live on a farm or have a barn or even on a large plantation. They lived in an ordinary house on the outskirts of town, a little house that had no, co no occasion for company or family gatherings. The foresters were new in town. The foresters hadn't even registered little Franny for her schooling. <gasps> Shame. There was something wrong with May and Ned. Something that she suspected but that little Franny didn't know for sure yet. They were her loving parents, or at the very least, the only parents she had loved, she had so she loved them fiercely. She didn't yet know what they were planning to surprise her with, since the rooster hadn't woken anyone in the house since it wasn't yet daybreak. That crazy rooster was the neighbor's rooster, Mr. Pink. The rooster, not the neighbor. The neighbor was old man Clive. Clive was about 70 years old and couldn't hear very well. He had a cane and a limp and bumps on his face. There were dark lines under his eyes and on his hands from some sort of accident. Little Franny, Little Franny didn't like Clive very much. He was absurd and creepy in the way that things under the bed or monsters in the closet might be to a child. He always had spit on his chin like a sick dog and a vacant look in his eyes that were perpetually full of white goop. It reminded Little Franny of paste and made her gag if she was eating marshmallows, which she didn't ever eat anymore. He was always trying to give her candy that she always refused. She hated even the way he smelled from a few feet away and was too freaked out by him to ever tread closer. His hand would sweep towards her young meaty arm and nearly take a hold of it. Little Franny was too quick for old Clive, so he never touched her. She kept an army of dolls on her window ledge to make sure he wouldn't come in, which made her wonder why she thought he would try. He had a cane and a limp after all. Nay and Med, who are always mom and dad, why wouldn't they be? We're about to wake up, Mr. Pink was about to crow, and the birthday was about to be official. Little Franny didn't know that she was moments away from opening her eyes and seeing the first sunrise of being nine years old. It came to pass. Mr. Pink let out his crow and the Forrester household jumped to life. 
Little Franny leaped from her bed and bid her dolls good morning and informed everyone it was her birthday. She skipped down the stairs in her pajamas and ran into the kitchen. Dad was already at the table and Mom was at the stove, stirring thick, gloppy oatmeal in a big pot. Oatmeal was not a special sort of meal for a special sort of day. And little Franny set her face to a pout which went ignored. Dad looked up from his paper and said nothing. Mom kept stirring. Did everyone forget today is my particular day? Little Franny thought as her arms crossed her chest. She waited a moment, then another. After moments of torturous silence, little Franny could take no more and tugged her mother's apron string. What is it? What is today? May Forrester turned around and looked down at her rug rat and poked a bony finger at her chest. Oh, that's right. It's someone's day. Silly me. I guess I forgot. Was it a game her mommy was playing with her? She couldn't tell as there was no smirk or smile on the face of the only mother little Franny had ever known. There was no laugh, no joke, and no jovial expression in the way she spoke. Such a lack of concern, in fact, that little Franny felt quite suddenly very alone in the little house of no occasion for company or fa uh, family gatherings, very alone and very small. Just when she thought she might actually break down and burst into tears in the middle of the kitchen floor, little Franny's mother actually laughed a little. <laughs> Franny, don't you want to go to the carnival? Little Franny could barely contain her excitement at the very mention of the carnival. She loved the carnival. She had only ever been twice in her whole life. Once when she was three and once when she was four. After that, the carnival skipped the town they had lived in before this one, and they had only been here a short time. Only enough time to unpack and meet old man Clive, who little Franny didn't like from the very first moment didn't like him one little bit, but she got the sense, the way only a child can, that her mother didn't like him either. Go upstairs right after breakfast, breakfast and put on your fancy dress and your pretty bows and we'll go. Little Franny forgot herself for a moment and turned to run to her room. A, stor a stern voice came from behind her. Franny, breakfast first. Franny ate the, the not very special breakfast very quickly, earning her a few sideboards glances from the only parent she'd ever known, warning glances that she was eating too fast for their liking, but letting it go, something she could only assume was due to the day being her particular day and there was a carnival to get to. She dressed quickly and put, on her, pr put her prettiest bows in her hair. Then the little family left and headed to the carnival. Yay! The scene was utter chaos. Children running, screaming, laughing, parents frantically trying to maintain the pace of those 20 years younger than themselves. Young lovers smiling at each other through their awkwardness as the Ferris wheel lulled them into a sense of weightlessness and flight. A small gang of jagged youths with angst and venom to unleash, cornering the smallest in their class against the back of a trailer, spewing teenage wrath, their barks much worse than their bites, just somewhere for their confused cacophony of hormones to rage. The smell of cotton candy, popcorn, body odor, flowers, perfume, and rotting garbage, unleashing a full frontal assault on the senses amidst the din, a staggering chorus that could reel a sane person to the brink of sanity without much effort, and an aphrodisiac for crazed. At least one of these young girls in the prime of her sexual awakening would never see the sun again. Nope. But that is neither here nor there. Little Franny was completely dazzled by the sights and sounds enveloping her small body and mind. Her mother was holding her hand as they purchased some tokens for the rides. Franny loved the merry-go-round the best of all, and she very much hoped that her mother, the only one she had ever known, would let her ride alone, seeing as how she was now old enough, <clears throat> especially on this particular special day. Even as enthralled as little Franny was, she sensed some small thing being exchanged between her mother and father. As they walked turn, around the games, something dark, like the way old man Clive sometimes looked at her. Little Franny wasn't as stupid as the only parents she had ever known thought she was, 
But no one said anything about that just now, as her father bolstered her with a large smile, which was a strange thing in itself, and sauntered up to a booth. He mumbled something to the man in the stupid hat behind the booth and was handed three balls. Little Franny assumed that he was supposed to hit something or another and win something or another and give it to her. She was right. He hurled the first ball too hard and missed, but the second one landed square on the mark. Little Franny was presented with a giant blue teddy bear and little else, her father walking too quickly and not saying very much at all or under his breath to her mother, but little else, not even a sideways glance to Franny. Something unsettling indeed, but she was too excited by the lights and smells and sounds and promise of at least one ride just ahead to think too much of it, so she didn't. Little Franny rode not one, not two, but four rides. She was windblown and full of sugar. The world around her was one of magical and fantastical things as she swooned towards the merry-go-round, her little feet barely touching the ground beneath them. Winded and near breathless, she looked up at her mother, this woman who had given her life and a home for all these years, her God for all intents and purposes and with large saucer-like eyes asked for the one thing she really wanted most. To her shock, this woman joyously replied in a voice that was bordered on relief. A token, my little one, for the merry-go-round. Go ahead and ride alone this time. We'll be waiting here, my little dear, when you're done, so we can go home. Little Franny's face lit up like the 4th of July, but blinked at her mother through the giant eyelashes for a single moment of doubt. Really, mother? The only mother that little Franny had ever known then knelt down and put her lean hand on her child's shoulder and for a moment looked wistful and somewhat sad, then smiled a, <laughs> smiled a weary, toothless smile. Yes, my little one, really. There was something strange behind the smile, something eerie and removed. But again, little Franny was too seduced by the snarling horse horses painted far too brightly, swirling behind her mother's head to pay it any attention. She darted off, turning once to look at the only parents she had ever known. They stood there like statues against the backdrop of the lights behind them, like some sort of shadow against a wall, not able to see their faces or expressions. Little Franny turned her attention back to the merry-go-round, approached the gate, handled the little man her token, and launched herself onto the deck of the ride and went in a circle twice to find the black horse, the only one that none of the other kids had claimed. A fierce creature reared towards the sky, eyes full of madness, mane shooting out like flames, something that nearly dared her to mount it, Something dangerous and unpredictable for the girl with the very pink bows winding through her dark tresses, and for the first time in a life that seemed mostly like a blur of safety, she was thrilled by the challenge presented before her. The horse was high off the platform, and she had to hoist herself to board him, grabbing the mane, twisting her small hands around the reins as she lifted her small body onto the giant beast. The entire world then started to move slowly around and around, the music increased its pace, the whole feeling changing and morphing. Little Franny became consumed by the feeling of the giant horse beneath her and how he rose and fell in an entirely new way. She giggled uncontrollably as her pulse quickened with this new sensation and looked out into the dizzying landscape for her parents, tried to pick them out against the sea of forms that whirred by, but she could not make them out and any time she thought she spotted them, for the briefest of seconds, the world would spin and she would lose them. A panic rose in her as the ride began to slow and she did not see the only parents she had ever known in the crowd. Tears choked their way into her throat as the ride came to a halt and she dismounted the giant horse too quickly and landed the wrong way on her ankle sending searing pain into her entire body and hurling her to the feet of the ride attendant. As the medics hauled her on the gurney to the makeshift nurse station, the search for little Franny Forrester's parents continued. They did not come running onto the platform when their child fell off the giant horse. They did not answer the calls from the bullhorn. They did not appear when the guards began to search the departing crowds for them. 
They had seemingly vanished, leaving little Franny there alone. The search continued to the neighborhoods, then the outskirts of town, and finally to the little house. The little house of no occasion for company or family gatherings and found it abandoned. There was no note, no indication of any kind of emergency, no messages left with the neighbor who had a way about him that even made the investigators edgy. The carnival madam saw little Franny and immediately sensed opportunity, one that she was not willing to let go of. Before the investigators could come back for the girl, the carnival had moved on. Little Franny sated on elixirs to keep her sleeping peacefully in the madam's trailer as they traveled onwards, leaving the investigators to assume that Franny's parents had found her somehow and closing the investigation since there was another girl missing, a girl with parents that were frantically pacing the station, their tears and outpouring of anguish drowning out the memory of little Franny as if it was a strange little dream that no one would remember. After all, no one even knew her or her family, and she wasn't even registered at the school. What becomes of little Franny is uncertain. What becomes of her parents, Ned and May, no one can say. They disappeared, as if into smoke, leaving the little house of no occasion for company or family gatherings, full of the things that would resemble a happy home life, until someone, someday, would stumble upon that little house and discover why it was all a lie. But that is another story entirely. Thank you. That is all I have for you for this story today. So that is the first installment. Creepy, spooky tales. Um, I was thinking alternating these. Reach out, let me know. I have a lot more stories. This one, as I said, came from a song that my band had written. It's actually called Abandoned, and it is on the album Temple of the Machine. We'll write a song or an album and stories will just pop into my head because it's like I'm possessed by something and the story just has to get out. So, yeah. So that's all we have. So we're gonna wrap up. Oh, thank you again so much, everyone. Thank you for joining and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.